I've been diving out here in the fjord. In some of these places, there's nothing alive. There's a, a conceptualization that many people have that the sea is untouched. For us to spend our days on the water, you can easily see the long-term impacts that, for example, farming and urban development have had on the coastal waters. My name is Daniel Taylor. I'm a marine scientist and postdoc here at PGU Aqua. I work uh, with uh, shellfish farms and I also research the ways that shellfish farms interact with the marine environment. We know that mussel farms can improve water quality and that they can extract a lot of nutrients from the water. An adult mussel can filter about five liters an hour of water. So if you can imagine all of these mussels individually filtering and we have line with millions and millions of mussels, this is, amounts to many thousands of cubic meters every day. Nitrogen is essential for all life and is a natural constituent of all environments, but too much of it can lead to overproduction in the environment. So in the case of our coastal environment, this is uh, manifested as an overproduction of phytoplankton. And this uh, tends to lead to this concept called eutrophication. And this is essentially an overabundance of organic material in the environment. And this can lead to all kinds of uh, very poor e ecological consequences, poor water clarity. Uh, and this means the light attenuation in the water column. So no light basically finding its way to the seafloor. Uh, it can be habitat loss at the seafloor because of uh, high organic sedimentation. So this is where you have very muddy sediments. Uh, eutrophication is a global problem. Denmark is a great case study uh, for this because over 60% uh, or so of the land cover in Denmark is agricultural. And that's a, that's a very high proportion of the land cover. And of course, when the, when the land is used to, for production of, of, of crops and, uh, and animals, then they require inputs. And those inputs tend to be fertilizers. And whether they're organic or inorganic, a proportion of them end up downstream flowing as water flows down into the coastal waters and further enriching those waters. We've, we've done some work on trying to uh, find out the most optimal places to grow mussels around Denmark and the Western Baltic. And it happens to be the most um, eutrophic places typically because they have the highest food concentrations. While they're filtering the water of organic particles, they're converting some of that to fecal waste. And that sinks fast and it goes down to the bottom under the mussel farm. <clears throat> Some people complain that this is actually uh, hurts the benthic ecosystem. And really, uh, I mean, I've been diving on this fjord for four years now, so uh, I've struggled to find any place that actually looks nice and it's not covered in mud. So when they are consuming some of those organic particles, and in a large amount, remember they're filtering many, many liters an hour, um, the portion that they're immobilizing is not sedimenting outside. So there is an increased amount of sedimentation within the farm, but on the whole, on the, on the whole ecosystem scale, there's less sedimentation. So this is, uh, have to have a wider field of view when we discuss the advantages and disadvantages of mussel farming. But in my view, and, and as a scientist studying mussel farms, the advantages far outweigh the disadvantages, especially in a system that's so impacted like the Limpion. When we discuss the use of uh, tools like mussel farming uh, to mitigate the effects of eutrophication, this touches to many different aspects of, that are important to society. So it needs to be informed by good science and data is important for regulators and policymakers that will have to figure out what's the best way to fix the problems 
that we have in our coastal ecosystems. I grew up on the Chesapeake Bay, which is another eutrophic estuary. Um, you know, I spent my youth uh, fishing and crabbing and eating shellfish. So I've always been interested in this field. I'm also stuck with this field because I do know that the production of shellfish, for example, is an extremely sustainable way to produce protein for a growing global population. This is a way to produce food that is extremely low in, with a carbon footprint. So it's a very climate friendly uh, food production method. It uh, doesn't require food inputs, so we don't have to use land in order to grow these organisms. They also provide a number of ecological benefits. They give habitat in places that have poor habitat. And it's a very healthy thing to eat. So if for me, it, this field just checks all the boxes off because we have, we're delivering, we're delivering science that may improve the health and well-being of the planet. Daniels forskning er med til at give ny viden om, hvordan Danmark kan beskytte og forvalte kystnære områder. Netop det arbejde er en del af verdensmål 14, livet i havet. Verdensmål 14 er en ambition om at bevare og sikre bæredygtig brug af verdens have og deres ressourcer. Den her video er en del af et undervisningsmateriale, og du kan finde mere viden på verdensmålene.dk.